Eddie Van Halen, the Guitar Hero's secret hell. The crowd roars as Eddie Van Halen rips into another face-melting solo. His fingers dance across the fretboard, coaxing out sounds that shouldn't be possible on six strings. To the thousands of screaming fans, he's a rock god, untouchable, invincible. But what they can't see is the bottle of vodka hidden behind his amp, or the lines of coke waiting in his dressing room, or the crippling anxiety that's eating him alive from the inside out. Welcome to the secret hell of rock's greatest guitar hero. See, Eddie Van Halen wasn't just playing with fire. He was the fire, burning bright, hot, and fast, incinerating everything in his path, including himself. Sure, you've heard eruption. You've air guitared to Panama. But do you know about the eruptions happening off stage? The paradise lost behind the scenes of rock paradise. From ear-splitting volumes to mind-numbing substances, from family drama to band meltdowns, Eddie's life was a volcano of chaos. And folks, that volcano was always on the verge of eruption. So strap in, turn it up to 11, and get ready to dive into the dark side of guitar greatness. Because Eddie Van Halen's story isn't just about legendary licks and groundbreaking solos. It's about a man who climbed to the top of Mount Olympus, only to find his own personal hell waiting for him there. Rise to fame. All right, buckle up. We're about to take a ride on the Van Halen Express, and this train has no brakes. Picture this. It's the early 70s in Pasadena, California. Two Dutch immigrant kids, Eddie and Alex Van Halen, are making a racket in their garage. Mum's probably got a headache, but the neighbors, they're in for one hell of a show. Eddie started on drums, if you can believe it. But when Alex got better than him, Eddie said, screw it, and picked up a guitar. Thank God for sibling rivalry, huh? Fast forward a few years and the Van Halen brothers hook up with David Lee Roth, a hyperactive kid with a voice that could shatter glass and an ego to match. Throw in Michael Anthony on bass and boom Van Halen is born. These guys cut their teeth playing backyard parties and dive bars. Eddie's shredding fingers were probably sticky with cheap beer more often than not. But even then, people knew there was something special about this skinny kid with the homemade guitar. Speaking of that guitar, Eddie couldn't afford the fancy stuff, so he built his own. The Frankenstrat was born, a mongrel instrument that looked like it had been through a war. Little did anyone know, it was about to start one. Van Halen's self-titled debut album hit in 1978 like a nuclear bomb. That tapping technique in Eruption. It was like Eddie had grown an extra pair of hands. Guitarists everywhere were left scratching their heads wondering, how the hell did he do that? Suddenly, Van Halen was everywhere. MTV, back when they actually played music, couldn't get enough of them. Eddie's fingers moved so fast the cameras could barely keep up. Album after album, hit after hit, running with the devil, ain't talking about love, jump. The hits just kept coming. Eddie Van Halen wasn't just playing guitar, he was rewriting the damn rule book. By the mid 80s, Van Halen was the biggest rock band on the planet sold-out arenas, multi-platinum albums, girls throwing themselves at the stage. They had it all. Eddie Van Halen, the dorky immigrant kid, had become a bona fide guitar god. He had the world at his feet and a perpetual grin on his face. But here's the thing about being on top of the world. There's nowhere to go but down. And man, was it going to be one hell of a fall. As the old saying goes, be careful what you wish for. Eddie had wished for rock stardom. He got it. And the price? Well, that's where our story really begins. Substance abuse. All right, folks. Time to pull back the curtain on rock and roll's favorite party trick, turning superstars into super messes. Eddie Van Halen didn't just play with fire on stage. He was guzzling it by the bottle off stage. We're talking vodka for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with a cocaine chaser. Rock and roll, baby. But let's rewind a bit. Eddie wasn't born with a bottle in his hand. Nah, this demon took its sweet time sinking its claws in. Picture this. It's the early days of Van Halen. The band's tearing up clubs and Eddie's nervous as hell. So what does David Lee Roth prescribe? A little liquid courage. Here, says Diamond Dave, handing Eddie a cigarette soaked in PCP. Talk about a gateway drug. 
From there, it was a slippery slope covered in booze and powdered with enough cocaine to make Tony Montana blush. I got drunk before I'd show up to high school, Eddie once admitted. I was terrified of being in front of people sober. Real healthy coping mechanism there, Ed. As Van Halen blew up, so did Eddie's habits. By the mid-80s, he was putting away a whole bottle of vodka and a quarter ounce of cocaine every day. You know, just to take the edge off. But hey, he was still shredding like a madman on stage, right? So what's the problem? Well, for starters, there was the time he got so wasted he fell out of a window and knocked himself unconscious. Or the countless shows played in an alcoholic haze. Or the fact that his son, Wolfgang, grew up thinking it was normal for dad to crack a beer for breakfast. Eddie tried to quit. Oh boy, did he try. Rehab stints, cold turkey attempts, you name it, he tried it. But the demon always clawed its way back. I didn't drink to party, Eddie said later. Alcohol and cocaine were private things to me. I would use them for work. The blow keeps you awake and the alcohol lowers your inhibitions. I'm sure there were musical things I would not have attempted were I not in that mental state. But here's the kicker. Even as the drugs and booze were eating him alive, Eddie was still making magic. Why Can't This Be Love was written during a bender that would have killed a lesser man. Talk about functional alcoholism. The substance abuse took its toll, though. It strained his relationships, messed with his health, and eventually started affecting his playing. The guy who once made guitar heroics look effortless was starting to struggle. By the 2000s, Eddie was a mess. His marriage was on the rocks, his body was rebelling, and the band was in shambles. Something had to give. In 2008, Eddie finally checked into rehab for good. He emerged sober, but the damage was done. Years of abuse had left their mark, and not just on his liver. Eddie Van Halen had won the battle with the bottle, but the war, that was far from over. Because while he was busy exercising one demon, a whole host of others were lining up to take its place. Turns out, being a guitar god isn't all it's cracked up to be. And Eddie? He was about to find out just how ungodly things could get. Relationship Turmoil If you thought Eddie's relationship with drugs and booze was complicated, wait till you hear about his love life. Spoiler alert, it's messier than a Van Halen after-party. Let's kick things off with Eddie's first marriage to actress Valerie Bertinelli. It was 1981, Van Halen was riding high, and Eddie was head over heels. A rock star marrying a TV darling? It was a match made in Hollywood heaven, or so everyone thought. See, the problem with marrying your dream girl is that eventually, you've got to wake up. And for Eddie and Valerie, reality hit like a post-gig hangover. On paper, they were the perfect couple. But behind closed doors, it was a different story. Eddie's substance abuse was driving a wedge between them faster than you can say, eruption. Valerie later spilled the beans. Ed and I had some wonderful, passionate times together, but we were terrible to each other too. Turns out, being married to a rock god isn't all guitar solos and groupies. Who knew? The couple tried to make it work, even having a son, Wolfgang, in 1991. But by the early 2000s, the marriage was hanging by a thread. They separated in 2001, and finally divorced in 2007. Eddie's take on the split. We grew apart. We parted amicably. Sure, Ed. Whatever helps you sleep at night. But wait, there's more. Because Eddie Van Halen doesn't do anything halfway, including failed marriages. Enter Janie Lazewski, Eddie's second wife. They tied the knot in 2009, shortly after Eddie got sober. It seemed like our guitar hero had finally found his happily ever after. Except... Well, you know how this story goes. The couple had their ups and downs, with rumors of splits and reconciliations swirling faster than Eddie's fingers on a fretboard. By 2020, just months before Eddie's death, they were reportedly living apart. Now let's not forget the other marriage in Eddie's life, his relationship with David Lee Roth and Van Halen. Talk about a rock and roll soap opera. Eddie and Dave were like oil and water, if oil and water could make incredible music together. They fought, they split, they reunited, they split again. It was enough to give a guy whiplash. When asked about working with Roth, Eddie once said, It's hard, because there are four people in this band, and three of us like rock and roll, and one of us likes dance music. Ouch. Feel the burn, Diamond Dave. The Van Halen saga saw more lineup changes than Eddie saw guitar techs. 
Roth out, Sammy Hagar in. Hagar out, Gary Sharon in. Sharon out, Roth back in. It was like a game of musical chairs, only with more alcohol and egos. Through it all, Eddie's personal life and professional life seemed to mirror each other. Chaotic, intense, and always on the verge of falling apart. In the end, Eddie Van Halen, the man who could make magic with six strings, couldn't seem to strike the right chord in his relationships. It was just another verse in the sad song of a rock and roll life. But hey, at least he had his health, right? Oh, wait. Health struggles. You'd think being a guitar god would come with some kind of divine health insurance. Spoiler alert, it doesn't. Eddie Van Halen learned this the hard way, as his body started to rebel against years of rock and roll excess. First up on the hit parade of health horrors, Eddie's hip. By the mid-90s, years of high-energy performances and on-stage acrobatics had taken their toll. The man who once leapt across stages like a caffeinated kangaroo now needed a hip replacement. Rock and roll, meet titanium and surgical screws. But a bum hip was just the opening act. The real headliner? Cancer. In 2000, doctors discovered cancer cells on Eddie's tongue. Now most folks would blame this on years of smoking. But Eddie, he had a different theory. He claimed it was from holding metal guitar picks in his mouth. Sure, Ed. And I'm sure all those cigarettes were just for show, right? Either way, Eddie had to have part of his tongue removed. A guitarist losing part of his hip is one thing, but a third of his tongue, that's like a painter losing a few fingers. But our boy Eddie wasn't about to let a little thing like cancer slow him down. He was declared cancer-free in 2002 and went right back to melting faces with his guitar solos. Take that, mortality! Except... The cancer had other plans. It came back this time in his throat. Eddie kept this battle quieter, but the toll it took was clear. The man who once pranced around stages like a hyperactive sprite was now visibly slower, frailer. As if cancer wasn't enough, Eddie's hard partying past came back to haunt him in other ways. Years of alcohol abuse had wrecked his pancreas, leading to bouts of pancreatitis that left him in agony. In a cruel twist of irony, the hands that could coax impossible sounds from a guitar were attacked by arthritis. The same fingers that revolutionized rock guitar were now struggling to form chords. Through it all, Eddie kept playing. Even when it hurt. Even when he was sick. Even when doctors told him to take it easy. Because for Eddie Van Halen, playing guitar wasn't just a job, it was oxygen. I can't do this and I can't do that, Eddie once said about his health struggles. But I can play guitar, so that's what I'm going to do until I can't do that. In his final years, Eddie's health became a constant battle. The cancer spread to other parts of his body. Chemo and radiation became as much a part of his routine as guitar practice. But even as his body failed him, his spirit remained unbroken. He continued to innovate, to create, to play. The fire that had driven him to redefine guitar playing now kept him going in the face of overwhelming odds. In the end, though, even guitar gods are mortal. Eddie Van Halen took his final bow on October 6, 2020, leaving behind a legacy that will echo through rock history forever. Eddie once said, I'm not your average trip. No kidding, Ed. From his meteoric rise to his long, painful fall, Eddie Van Halen's life was anything but average. It was a rock and roll symphony of triumph and tragedy, played at full volume until the very end. And the world, we're still cranking it up and listening in awe. Band conflicts. If you thought your family reunions were awkward, you should have seen a Van Halen band meeting. This wasn't just musical chairs, it was musical ejector seats. At the center of this hurricane of hairspray and ego was Eddie Van Halen trying to keep the band together while it seemed hell-bent on tearing itself apart. Let's start with the classic lineup: Eddie, his brother Alex, bassist Michael Anthony, and the human equivalent of a peacock, David Lee Roth. They were the Beatles of spandex, the Marx Brothers of metal. And like all great partnerships, they were about as stable as nitroglycerin. Eddie and Dave were like matter and antimatter. Eddie, the obsessive perfectionist, spent hours tweaking his guitar tone. Dave? He was more concerned with how many high kicks he could do while wearing assless chaps. Their clash came to a head in 1985. The story goes that Eddie was sick of Dave's antics, and Dave was sick of, well, everything that wasn't about Dave. The split was messier than a food fight at a Motley Crue concert. 
Enter Sammy Hagar, the Red Rocker himself. Suddenly, Van Halen went from party rock to dad rock faster than you could say, why can't this be love? For a while, things were groovy. Van Hagar topped charts, sold out arenas, and Eddie seemed happy. But you know what they say about happiness in rock bands? It's about as long-lasting as a guitar pick. By the mid-90s, tensions were high again. Sammy wanted to tour. Eddie wanted to tinker in the studio. Sammy liked tequila. Eddie had switched to vodka. Creative differences, they called it. Creative differences that ended with Sammy quitting or being fired, depending on who you ask. Then came the Gary Cherone era. Remember that? No? Don't worry, neither does anyone else. It was like that weird dream you have after eating too much pizza, confusing, slightly uncomfortable, and best forgotten. Through all this, Eddie's relationship with original bassist Michael Anthony was souring faster than milk in the sun. Eddie accused Michael of siding with whoever was the lead singer at the time. Michael probably just wanted everyone to get along and play some damn music. By the 2000s, Van Halen was less a band and more a soap opera with guitars. They reunited with Sammy, then with Dave, then with Sammy again. It was like watching your parents get divorced, remarry, divorce again, and then try to date your uncle. Eddie's solution. Bring in his son Wolfgang to replace Michael on bass. Because nothing says functional band dynamic like firing a guy who's been with you for 30 years and replacing him with your teenager. To his credit, Wolfgang held his own. But for fans, it was another sign that Van Halen, the band, the brotherhood, the legend, was fracturing beyond repair. Through it all, Eddie remained the constant, the eye of the storm. He was Van Halen for better or worse, but even he couldn't keep the band from imploding. In his later years, Eddie mused about one last tour, one last album, the big Van Halen reunion, but like so many rock and roll dreams, it remained just that, a dream. Van Halen's story is a cautionary tale of egos, artistic differences, and the pressures of maintaining a brotherhood forged in the fires of rock stardom. It's a reminder that sometimes, the hardest part of being in a band isn't playing the music. It's dealing with the other people playing it with you. In the end, maybe Eddie's greatest trick wasn't his two-handed tapping technique. Maybe it was keeping Van Halen alive as long as he did. Despite the revolving door of singers, the family drama, and enough bad blood to fill the whiskey a go-go. Now that's what I call a virtuoso performance. Perfectionism and creative pressure. Ever wonder what it's like inside the mind of a genius? In Eddie Van Halen's case, it was probably louder than a Marshall stack at full volume, and twice as chaotic. See, Eddie wasn't just playing guitar, he was chasing perfection, note by blistering note. And let me tell you, perfection is one hell of a demanding mistress. This wasn't just about getting the songs right for the records. Oh no. This was about reinventing the wheel every time he picked up a guitar. Normal folks practice scales. Eddie. He was trying to break the sound barrier with six strings and a whammy bar. I've always pushed myself to the edge, Eddie once said. No kidding, Ed. The edge. You were hanging off it by your fingertips, doing one-armed pull-ups. Take his iconic two-handed tapping technique. Most guitarists would have been content with inventing it, but not our Eddie. He spent countless hours refining it, pushing it further, trying to coax sounds out of his guitar that it probably never dreamed it could make. This perfectionism extended to every aspect of his playing and gear. Eddie wasn't satisfied with off-the-shelf guitars and amps. He had to modify everything, creating his own unique sound. The Frankenstrat wasn't just a cool-looking guitar, it was a physical manifestation of Eddie's relentless pursuit of tonal perfection. But here's the kicker. The better he got, the higher he set the bar for himself. It was like being on a treadmill that kept speeding up. No wonder the guy needed a drink or ten. This pressure didn't just come from within, either. The music world was always watching, always waiting for the next Eddie Van Halen innovation. How do you follow up Eruption? How many times can you reinvent rock guitar before you run out of ideas? As Eddie put it, I'm not a rock star, I am a musician. But the world wanted both. The rock star antics and the musical genius. Talk about a rock and a hard place. In his later years, this perfectionism turned into a kind of musical isolation. 
Eddie retreated to his studio, endlessly tinkering with sounds and ideas. The man who had once set stages alight across the world was now more comfortable in the controlled environment of his 5,150 studios. The price of genius, it seems, is never being satisfied. Always hearing the notes that aren't there, always reaching for that perfect tone that exists only in your head. Eddie Van Halen changed guitar playing forever, but maybe the hardest person to impress was always himself. In the end, his greatest rival wasn't Ingwie Malmsteen or Steve Vai, it was the Eddie Van Halen of his own imagination, always one impossible guitar lick ahead.